In this video, we're going to cover the abstract factory pattern within Java. The abstract factory pattern is different from the regular factory pattern in that you basically add another layer of abstraction. And what you're doing is you're creating a set of related objects rather than just a single object. If you're not already familiar with simple factory and what we call regular factory or factory method pattern, I'd recommend you get up to speed on those here really quick. To really explain abstract factory, let's start where we ended off with the regular factory pattern and then let's extend it and see where it starts to break down. Let's get into it. All right, this is the code that we ended with last time. We've got our main method and then we're constructing two different types of candy stores and then we're calling the sell candy method on these where that sell candy method has this get candy factory method that is then implemented by subclasses of the candy store class. So gumdrop store and starburst store, both which extend candy store. And then each of these create different types of candy objects, gumdrops and starbursts. So what this allows for is decoupling of object creation and business logic that uses the objects that were created. And just to touch on what the candy class is doing, it's also an abstract class that has two abstract methods. And then we've got two implementations, the gumdrop and the starburst implementations. And then those just provide implementations of the abstract methods. Now this code does work. And if I run it, this is an example of factory pattern. We can see here that since our main method is calling sell candy on the gumdrop and the starburst store, we are selling a gumdrop and we're selling a starburst. And we have some specific behavior as far as the level of sweetness of a gumdrop versus a starburst. So this is great. When we have a store that needs to sell candy, we can have a factory pattern because we can have that factory generate candy. Now let's say that our store needs to expand and instead of just selling candy, we also need to sell candy along with the wrapper that would go with the candy because the customer may want to get more than just the physical candy in their hand. Let's say they want to wrap it. When I sell a starburst, it's not just the candy, it's wrapped up. When I sell a gumdrop, maybe I sell it in like a little baggie or something like that. So let's think about how we could do this. One way is we could update our get candy method to instead of returning candy, I want it to return a component or let's say a candy component. And that candy component could either be the candy itself or it could be the candy wrapper. So now our get candy method, which returns a candy object, would have to return a candy component. And the candy component would have four different subclasses. It would have the starburst and the gumdrop like it does already. But then over here, our other candy component is the actual wrapper. Let's say we have bag versus plastic wrapper. Now we have four different subclasses that we would have to use within the get candy method. And we'd have to indicate whether we are looking for candy or for wrappers. Let me just write some code really quick to kind of demonstrate that. <laughs> All right, so I added a fair amount of code here and we can see that we added a little bit extra onto the end of our print statements here. So now our candy is wrapped in a candy bag if it is a gumdrop and for a starburst it is wrapped in plastic wrap or I guess the starburst wrapper however you want to call it but in the process I had to add more code than I really wanted to so what I had to do was my sell candy method from the main perspective stayed the same but I had to make this get candy component method take a new parameter which is the component type because I didn't just want to use strings I wanted to use enums so that I could have a known enumeration right so I have to add a new enum now I have to go into the candy component and have a component type for whether I'm looking at candy versus a wrapper and then now every time I call my factory method get candy component now I'm back to the same problem of having to have business logic in the factory method Again, this is fine when you have simple factories because maybe that's all you need, but usually by the time that you're looking at full factory or even abstract factory, you really wanna limit the business logic you have to do for conditionally making objects of different types within the factory method. And what we're gonna do to get closer to abstract factory is instead of having one factory method, the get candy component method, 
we're going to create two different factory methods. We're gonna have one for candy and one for wrapper. And now candy and wrapper don't need to have a common base class that everybody instantiates from, which by the way, with the candy component concept is also a problem because up here I have this candy component class and it's abstract and it has the sweetness and the name. So sweetness makes sense for gumdrops and for starbursts, but what sweetness makes sense for a bag or for a plastic wrap? That doesn't make a lot of sense. You could just have a deeper inheritance hierarchy. You could have a candy component and then you could have candy and candy wrapper under candy component, but at what point are you over designing something that it doesn't need to be over designed? Let's undo everything we just did. This is what you want to avoid because you are stuck in a factory and you need an abstract factory. So reverting everything, we'll start fresh and in this time we'll use the abstract factory pattern. All right, much better. The only thing I did that is different from what we started with is the cell candy method still is a little bit different here. And that is I've got a stubbed out to be determined to indicate that we still are gonna wrap this candy with something. Otherwise, everything else is back to where it was. So how we're going to approach it differently is we're gonna create a new class that represents wrappers. That's gonna look a lot like candy. So if we go right click, new Java class, and we're gonna make wrapper, we're actually gonna make it an interface this time. Let's just make a method called name, similar to what we have for candy. And this time, instead of making an abstract class, we'll make it an interface. Again, a bit of a potato potato in this case. All right, so now that we have wrapper, let's make a class called bag, which implements wrapper. And then let's make a class called plastic wrapper which implements wrapper. Now we have to implement our methods here. We'll just call this bag. And then we'll call this plastic wrapper. So same concept with candy. We have different classes that are specific concrete implementations of this generic interface here. And now what we wanna to do to make this an abstract factory is we're going to create like objects in like areas. So the gumdrop store now is gonna to have to create both the candy as well as the wrapper for that candy. Thus we need a new abstract method. So we'll call this wrapper and then we will say get wrapper. And now we have to implement get wrapper method, which in the case of Starburst is going to return a new plastic wrapper. And in the case of Gumdrop is gonna return a new bag. That is the fundamental concept of abstract factory. Basically, we're using a combination of inheritance and polymorphism to define the concrete implementations of like classes that need to be instantiated together within logic. And the beauty of this is that all like logic gets coupled together because the creation logic for all of the things the gumdrop store needs to do and the specific implementations of those are all tied within the gumdrop store. And now all the logic for what the cell candy method needs to do is all within cell candy and nothing more. So now I can make my final wrapper. It's gonna be the get wrapper method. And then I can say wrapper.name. And now we have a very generic cell candy method with very specific implementations of the concrete classes we need, completely decoupled, and this allows for very extendable code and really good testing infrastructure when you need to essentially inject like let's say a mock or something like that to test how your code works. This is a great design pattern if you need it. Just to see some example output of the program, we get a gumdrop with a particular amount of sweetness and it has an associated wrapper type with it. Same thing with the starburst. So the big takeaway from Abstract Factory is that when you need it, this is a very powerful design pattern. However, 
there are a lot of classes here. There's a lot going on. This may initially look difficult to follow if somebody doesn't realize you're using abstract factory. They might just ask, well, why don't you have all the logic in the cell candy method? And you might be right. Sometimes it would make sense to have the cell candy method have a lot of the logic. But let's say that your cell candy method just gets bigger and bigger because you keep adding more candies. That is a maintenance nightmare. And that's where you get into functions that are hundreds of lines long and are really difficult to debug and really difficult to test. You want to avoid that at all costs. But you also don't want to overdesign something. So I caution you, when you're looking at factory patterns, especially abstract factory, make sure that you're using the right level of factories. On one hand, a simple factory is usually all you need. And it really does a good job. And a lot of the times, if I see a usage of factory or abstract factory, I ask myself, is simple factory something we could have used instead? On the other hand, maybe you need factory. Maybe you need to create a single object and you want a factory method to be inherited by the subclasses which determine how to construct each of those objects. And then all the way over here, you need to create like objects, not just one, but multiple. And then now you need an abstract factory. Hopefully this clarifies some of the use cases of the different factory types. In the end, keep it simple where possible. Don't overdesign it but also don't get in the trap of not redesigning when it needs to happen. Follow along with where your code needs to be maintained. If it is a maintenance nightmare and you need to restructure it for future extension, great, go ahead and do that. On the other hand, over design, just like premature optimization is a really bad thing to do and it results in all this code bloat. So make sure when you are looking at which pattern to use, you clearly understand the use case as well as a general understanding of future use cases but not assuming that a future use case is necessarily gonna be the now use case. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please just smash that like button. I'd really appreciate it. If design patterns are something that interests you, I'd recommend you check out some of my other videos on design patterns. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.